Thanks to everybody joining us right now. We're happy to have you in the room with us, so to speak. And I'm just giving everybody a moment to, to, to join and get in. Um, we're really happy to have you joining us for another Olive Tree webinar. Uh, and good morning or afternoon or evening, depending where you're at in the world. Uh, excited about the topic tonight. This is something that I think is really relevant to all of us. And I was just telling Christy, who uh, will be presenting to us today, that I've been waiting for, for this myself. She's got some, some good things to share, I think, on stress. This is something that uh, all of us encounter, no matter where we are in the world or what type of topic um, or job job that we have. So we're, we're looking forward to hearing from you, Christy. Uh, just briefly, Christy is uh, Christy Otten is a member of the Olive Tree Board, so she is a, a great contributor to Olive Tree. Um, she's she and her husband live in Belgium and have for about four years now. So she lives in an overseas context herself and is raising her family um, in an overseas context, working both as a counselor and um, doing member care for her organization. I'll let her tell you a little bit more about her life in context, but. I say all of that to say that she gets it when it comes to cross-cultural work and overseas living and um, probably a fair amount of stress knowing knowing her uh, her cross-cultural situation and being a mother of, of three young boys as well. So Christy, we'll pass it over to you uh, in just a second. I'll also just say as everybody, I think most people are, have joined us at this point, um, that we are, we are running this as we typically do. We're asking that you keep your microphones muted um, just so that we can have a, a clear recording that we'll post on the website. And, um, but feel free to turn on your camera if you'd like to. Um, and we'll ask when there's participation, we'll ask you to participate through the chat uh, and, and have you chat directly to me with questions or comments that you'd like to include. We'll also be having some breakout rooms um, for some discussion, uh, in which point you're obviously free to un unmute your microphone and participate in some of the breakout rooms for discussion a few times throughout the webinar. So I think that's all of the, the details that we need to go over. Uh, without further ado, Christy will hand it over to you. Great. Thanks, Lisa. Um, hi, everyone. It's good to see you all. Um, as Lisa said, um, I live in Leuven, Belgium, with my husband and three children. Uh, we were, went to Leuven um, because of my husband's job. He is a New Testament prof there in the grad school. Um, and our three boys are Kai, Caleb, and Sam. Um, Kai would want you to know that he turned seven in about two weeks. Um, but the other three are five and three. And um, my husband is currently actually in Leuven taking care of the three boys for me while I am on the road uh, traveling while I um, work to help support some of our workers being affected by uh, the Ukraine-Russia crisis. And so I am actually in Budapest right now and it, it looks like my Wi-Fi is pretty good here. So I hope that holds up for us. Um, my role in Leuven though is I work for our organization doing member care. I also um, provide counseling support to students at the school my husband teaches at, and I also um, am doing more and more work within our community, um, especially as my Dutch gets better. We're in the Flemish part of Belgium, so it's Dutch speaking for us there. Um, previous to coming to Belgium, I was in private practice for about five years, and I did my master's at Trinity Seminary uh, in Deerfield, Illinois, and then um, undergrad at Wheaton College, so perhaps some of you know those schools. Um, but let's talk today about what we are going to be studying. I keep kind of clicking on the wrong thing there. Okay, uh, so where are we headed? It's always helpful to know that. Um, I'm hopeful that tonight um, or today you will be learning some new ideas about stress and some new approaches towards it. Um, ultimately, I hope you walk away from this really encouraged. Um, when I was first asked to do a workshop on stress, I'll be honest, I was really not excited. Um, I thought, oh, okay, we're gonna have to talk to people about, you know, just try to get rest and um, just try to, you know, make it through when it's stressful. And, and as a therapist, it can just be really debilitating to feel like you can't be really helpful to people in talking about stress. Um, but today, um, 
as you will find, is I am really excited about the research that's coming out about stress and what it means for us and how we could um, ultimately have some really deep change affected in our lives by understanding this research. So hopefully by the end of our journey uh, today, you will be feeling differently about stress yourself. Um, <clears throat> so first of all, what's important is that this is really applicable to you. And so I would love for you to be, even now, just thinking through, how do I think about stress? What is stress in my life? Um, is it a negative thing? Is it a positive thing? Um, how do we view it? How do we feel about it? How does it affect us? Um, I really want you to kind of be bringing those questions up for yourself right now. Um, as this slide brings forward, I think we often think of negative things in relation to stress. Um, we think about being tired, being depressed, the pressure, um, things like that. According to the American Institute of Stress, the definition of stress is, while everyone can't agree on a definition of stress, which is true, if you ever look for a definition, it's hard to find just one. All of our experimental and clinical research confirms that the sense of having little or no control is always distressful. And that's what stress is all about, is all about. And so it's that little or no control piece we're looking at and thinking about. Um, and historically, stress is understood as a negative experience. Um, it should be avoided, should be decreased, or it should be managed. Um, anytime we're talking about managing something, that usually doesn't mean it in a positive way. So um, I think those are the words we often hear about stress. Um, now, before I came to the field, I was asked to fill out this kind of stress inventory. Perhaps some of you were as well or have seen this type of thing. What it is, and I know the screen is small there, is it asks you to mark what kind of life changes you might be going through in the next so many days. And then as you do that, then you score that. And based on your score, it determines how healthy you should expect to be in the next year or two. Well, before we came to the field, um, we already had two children. Our older one had had some um, significant medical issues. Um, we were gonna be changing jobs. We were gonna change our location, obviously. Um, we were going to um, go through all these other life changes. And then right as I took this inventory thing, I just learned I had a surprise third pregnancy. And so now I also knew that I was also gonna have a baby in the midst of all of this. And so when I scored mine, Basically, it said, in about two years, you should expect a very significant physical um, health problem. And so it's almost like I should pencil in in about two years, I need to have a long stay in the hospital. Um, and I found that really deflating at the time. Now, I can understand why it can be important to open people's eyes to the kind of changes they're going to experience and things like that. But I found it just so discouraging to think, okay, by following what I believe to be God's will for my life, I'm going to sign up for um, something that is going to be really um, detrimental to my health. Um, and so I just wondered, could there be a different view on this? Um, does stress have to mean lost years, uh, lost health, lost hope? Um, and so that's what I was wondering about and curious about as I was then, as I said, had been asked to do this, uh, not this workshop, but another workshop on stress. And that's when I came across Dr. Kelly McGonigal. Um, if you are into TED Talks, she does a great TED Talk you can check out. Um, and this is her book, The Upside of Stress. And a lot of what we're talking about today is gonna be from her research. I've kind of gone back through and looked at her research, gone back to the original studies, um, just to make sure that they were well supported and kind of looked at other research supporting that. Um, so this is a really good resource though, if you're curious about what we're talking about today. Um, and what we learned, I learned through her is that based on, a, on the new mindset research being done, um, you can have a whole different perspective on stress. In fact, the idea is you embrace stress as a resource rather than as a detriment in your life. So first of all, who is uh, Dr. McGonigal? Uh, she is a health psychologist out of Stanford. Um, and she historically had embraced a very negative view of stress and was actually very busy with teaching people about how to manage it, how to survive it, um, how to reduce it. That was the talk she gave often. So what changed? Well, she came across the following study. Now, I want you to stick with me. I'm going to be giving you lots of research tonight, but it's cool stuff, and so it's important you hear some of these numbers. Okay, so this study tracked 30,000 adults, 
quite a large data sample. And they were asked in 1998 how much stress they had had and how they viewed it. Important, how they viewed it. In 2008, public records were used to then track the fatality rate of those same 30,000. Well, um, what, they did, what they found was that a high level of stress did increase the risk of fatality. So that was true. The high level of stress did increase the rate of fatality or risk of fatality, excuse me. However, and this is what's key, it was not the stress alone that increased the risk. It was the combination of the higher stress combined with a negative view of stress. Those with the same levels of stress who reported a positive view or even just a neutral view of stress were healthy and actually had the lowest risk of death of everyone. Um, so this needs to be emphasized. <laughs> it is not the stress itself that caused biological harm alone. It was the belief that stress would cause biological harm along with the stress. Um, that can kind of be mind blowing when you think about it. Um, how can it be how I'm thinking changes my body? Um, for the most part, all of us understand that our physical body can affect our mind. I think that's pretty well supported. Um, if you exercise, if you get out for that run, um, your concentration is going to improve, your mental clarity improves, you're going to have better energy, you're going to, it can work as an, almost an antidepressant. Um, these are the type of things that are pretty well researched, well talked about, we're all pretty familiar with at this point. Um, and so the idea that your body can affect your brain, we kind of get that. Um, but we rarely consider how your brain, how you think, can actually affect your physical body. Um, and that's a pretty cool thing. Um, and I'm gonna keep bringing this up throughout this, but one reason I love being a therapist is because I really love Jesus and I love seeing that good psychology actually only shows us that the Bible um, knows us far better than we realize. And so even like with this right now, just be thinking about how often does the Bible tell you to think about things that are good for you? Interesting things to note here. Um, but let me share with you a couple more really fun studies to help you kind of start to get your head around this a little more. One study that was done was on hotel domestic workers, so hotel cleaners. Um, they took two groups of workers, and the first group of workers, they simply explained to them what the benefits of exercise are. Here's what exercise can do for you. Here's why you should do exercise. The second group, they explained the benefits of exercise but then went further by explaining, here is how your job is exercise, how the work you're doing, lifting those mattresses, vacuuming, cleaning the bathroom, how you are actually meeting the Surgeon General's recommendation for exercise on a daily basis. Did these two presentations, probably about 10 or 15 minutes a piece, okay? Tracked the workers. Four weeks later, there was no change in the first group. They knew what exercise was, knew it could benefit them, no change. However, for the second group who had had that 15 minute intervention, no other changes were made in their lifestyle. They found that that group had lost weight and body fat and had better muscle tone and had more positive use of their job. Even their blood pressure was lower. Um, and again, no other change had been taken excepting a 15 minute intervention explaining here is how what you're doing is exercise. Um, so again, how we thought or how they're thinking about their job actually changed their body in a chemical way. That's, I find that really cool. I hope you guys too, do too. Um, the next study um, they did was um, one using um, the idea of a mock interview. Um, and so as you can imagine, for most people, mock interview is pretty stressful. And so what they did is they just did an intervention with two separate groups. The first group had a three minute video explaining how stress can actually be good for your body, how stress can enhance your performance, how stress is actually trying to help you. Um, the second group um, was kind of given almost like the normal approach on stress. Stress is really difficult for you. It's not good for your body. You really wanna to try to manage it. Try to calm down right now for your interview. Um, 
And so afterwards, what they did then is they measured uh, their saliva. They studied the saliva of each participant. And what they found was this. So first of all, you need to know there's two hormones that you can find in saliva. And I'm sorry, that are also considered stress hormones. Um, one is cortisol and one is DHEA. They both do kind of two different things. Neither one's necessarily bad or good, but what's important is the ratio. You want a good ratio of those two because what happens is when you get that good ratio, growth can happen. They call it the growth ratio. So it's actually, um, you have an experience, you learn from it, you grow from it. That's when like you have that good ratio going on. If instead it just becomes awful and you wanna avoid it, that ratio isn't gonna happen. What they found was that the participants that were told stress was bad, um, they um, didn't have any real changes happen to them. They both groups experienced the same amount of one type of hormone called the cortisol. The other group though, that had that three minute video telling them how stress could be good for them actually had a much higher growth ratio. And as the participants were evaluated by um, blind studiers, so they didn't know who had gotten what intervention, they were seen by reading their body language, by how they presented, but they just did a better job giving the speeches, um, doing their interviews because they had more confidence coming into it. Um, so again, we saw on a chemical level that even a three minute intervention and understanding and thinking differently about stress could actually change your body and how um, it plays out the scenario with stress. Okay, so what we need to talk about is what is a mindset then? Um, a mindset is understood as a belief that shapes your reality, including objective physical reactions and even long-term health, happiness, and success. So while, well, for example, you might think dogs are a better pet to have than cats, that's not necessarily a mindset. Some of you might argue otherwise, that might've been a bad example, but, um, but a mild preference is not gonna be a mindset. Instead an understanding about your life view and overarching belief that's gonna affect all so many decisions you make. That is what we're talking about with a mindset. Um, it, it influences how you carry out daily life and how you think about life. Here's the thing, mindsets can be changed. And it is important to realize that you can actively direct your thoughts and attitudes. Um, a lot of us feel that we're victims to our thoughts and attitudes, um, but research has shown, and we have seen it, um, I have seen it in, in therapy, I've seen it in my own life, mindsets can be changed. This is where hearing how you talk to yourself and how you talk to others is extremely important. Um, and we're gonna kind of keep coming back to that, but a few examples of what I uh, mean by that. Um, a lot of mindset research shows up in the area of education. And so if you've been, if you're in the field of education, you're probably already going, yeah, 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 heard about mindsets a bit. But um, in the 90s in America in particular, it was really um, emphasized that self-esteem was really important. And how they understood self-esteem to be raised in people was to praise them. And so just keep telling um, your child they're really good at that whether or not they're performing well, just keep saying, hey, great job, you're awesome. Um, it's kind of where like they came up with the idea of like a trophy generation, almost like everyone got a trophy. Um, but what they found is that praising and constant rewarding actually lowers self-esteem and lowers performance. Um, but when hard work and perseverance are encouraged, growth could happen and better performance um, was achieved. The idea being there that if we're telling someone, well, you're just so smart, um, you're just really smart and they, they're gonna take that on as a label. And so now when I have to go do something or perform for you and I'm not sure how to do it, um, I'm not gonna even wanna try. I'm gonna wanna avoid it because I don't want you to think I'm not smart anymore. I'd be so embarrassed if you actually learned that I was dumb. But instead I said, oh, but you're learning and you're, you're getting so much and you just keep working so hard. Now I have the freedom to go ahead and just try and to see what happens. And that will actually encourage better performance overall. So they've seen, for example, like intelligence is not a fixed trait. Um, that is a trait that can grow over time because we can allow for that space for people to learn and grow. Um, a personal example of this, um, as I mentioned, we're in, uh, in Flanders, and so when we first moved there, my oldest, I think, was around uh, four, three or four, and uh, he was going to the Dutch speaking school and finding it really hard. Um, and we were just, oh, Kai, you're doing great. Um, you're speaking so well and all of this. 
um, until one night at bedtime, and I still remember this, my sweet four-year-old boy was just with me and he tearfully told me, mommy, I'm not very good at Dutch. I just don't understand it. And, oh, that was one of those moments where you think, how did I not think about this? Um, we quickly realized the mistake we'd been making. I didn't feel the freedom to learn or to admit that it was hard because we just kept telling him he was really good at it. But the really cool thing is, is we quickly changed our language to him about it, kept encouraging him and how hard he was working at it, how he was really trying to learn, how we were all working together at learning the language. And in just a few weeks time, his proficiency in Dutch began to explode. Uh, because he now had the freedom to learn, to make mistakes, to figure it out. Um, it's important how we talk um, to others and to ourselves. Um, and just even on, this is a kind of a silly example I use sometimes with talking to ourselves. You might wonder what I mean by that. Um, you can't see because I'm sitting down right now, but I'm actually about six feet tall. And um, that has been an interesting piece of my entire life. Come from Chicago, so I mean, it was awesome. I played basketball and volleyball because that's what you do if you're from Chicago and tall. Um, but it also means I got a lot of feedback about my height that I was not asking for. Um, I worked at Starbucks and I was told anything from, wow, you are the tallest barista I've ever seen um, to being asked like if I was standing on a box behind the counter. Um, and so what I learned over time was if I made the joke first, that would keep other people from making a joke. But I still remember there was one day where uh, at a job, a supervisor said to me, hey, Christy, I notice every, anytime we meet someone, you make a joke about your height. And I just want you to know that that makes me feel kind of bad because I think that means that you feel embarrassed about your height and you shouldn't feel embarrassed. And to be honest, I was just then really embarrassed that she'd noticed that, um, but decided I was gonna just try an experiment. Could I just stop saying things to other people about my height? Um, and it was really amazing. I did. I just stopped commenting on my height to others. And I even challenged myself in my head when I wanted to make a joke about my height. I wasn't gonna do that anymore. And I can tell you, I feel a lot more confident in my height, but the amazing thing too is other people don't make jokes about my height anymore. There's always you know, that one person here or there, but in general, people don't make a joke anymore. Um, and so it's important how we talk to ourselves about how, how we view ourselves. Um, and it's important to notice that voice. You might think, okay, your height's not that important, but there's other issues we all talk to ourselves about. Um, so you wanna kind of turn the volume up on that voice and try to be noticing it, because that's gonna help you as we talk about mindsets. So how do you change a mindset? Well, um, there's steps to it, and we're gonna work on it uh, today even. But the first step is to learn um, new information or point of view. Um, so in this case, we're, we're talking about stress as a resource. That's a new point of view. And then you do an exercise that helps you take on that new point of view. You'll see what I mean by that as we go on. And then it's important that you share it with others because uh, that starts to help it cement in your mind. Um, and that's, that's how you go about changing a mindset. But what's incredible overall about mindsets and what I hope you're hearing is that they are an inc incredible tool as they are often quite short. It can be as little as a three minute video or a 15 minute conversation. Um, and can provide lasting changes though. Um, these studies I've shared with you might sound short, but there's other ones that show long-term change affected through these short interventions. Um, one other thing I should just note, you might be thinking, yeah, Christy, but it sounds like people kind of got tricked into this. Like, so are we not gonna be able to do this because like we know what we're trying to do? Don't worry, this still works even when you know what you're doing. Um, and so this can still be effective in your life. I found it effective in mine. What I'm encouraging you to do, I've been doing in my life. So um, we'll keep moving forward then. So um, the first um, area to reframe or the first mindset we wanna look at is a stressed life to a meaningful life. And what do I mean by that? Well, where would you be without the stresses you have. Um, think about what causes stress in your life. It might be your work, your kids, your relationships, um, your ministry, your studies. So when we say you don't wanna have so much stress, does that mean you don't want those things in your life? That's probably not true for you. Um, so is it possible that these things that are stressful are the things also bringing meaning to your life? Um, Dr. McGonigal actually in her book, I um, define stress as stress is what arises when something you care about is at stake. 
Um, we don't often stress about things we don't care about, right? We, I don't even know how you could do that necessarily. I'm really stressed about it, but I don't care about it at all. Um, doesn't usually work that way. Um, the things that cause us stress are what we care about. I, I was thinking about this actually yesterday. I was waiting um, to fly um, to Budapest from England yesterday. And so I was on the tarmac waiting. And flying is way easier without my three kids with me. Let's be honest, a little less stressful. But as we were waiting, another plane taxied by to go take off. And there was just a group of adults standing in line. And we were all just standing there, kind of looking off board as this plane went by. I could imagine if my boys had been there, they would have been jumping up and down, waving at that pilot, thinking like the whole world was a better place because they got to see an airplane go by. Um, it adds meaning to your life. It can add fun to your life when those stressful things are also present. <laughs> and I'm not naming my children as stressful things, although it did come out that way. Um, a Gallup World Poll found that a nation's well-being was connected to its level of stress, but not the way you might think. What they found was a nation that reported a high level of stress also reported higher levels of happiness, satisfaction, and overall health. And so again, stressed life is a meaningful life. Um, and if we are determined to take stress out of our lives, that could mean we're trying to take meaning out of our lives. Um, and so perhaps instead of thinking of our lives as so stressful, could we change that to thinking our lives are very meaningful? Um, how do we do this though? Well, one piece that's really important in this is identifying the values in your life and seeing those in your everyday tasks. Um, so um, I'll give you a study on this and then I'll give you some other practical exam examples. Um, a study that was done um, was on, this, on Stanford students who were home on Christmas break. One group was asked to journal about their values over the break and the other group is asked to journal on the good things that happened during their break. So you might have expected that people that just had a lot of good things happen on their break came back with um, higher health scores, um, higher satisfaction. But what they found was that the values group reported better health and satisfaction upon return. Um, what they found was that like a student that oh, it's, you know, they might have said it was just so annoying because I had to bring my sister to her band practice every day because my parents were busy. But instead of you were looking at your values, it became, well, I do really care about my, value, uh, about my family and they're a really important value to me. And so by bringing my sister to practice every day, I could kind of play out that value in my life. So suddenly what could be a stressful thing, an annoying thing even became something of value. And actually students with higher levels of stress reported the highest positive impact from values journaling. Um, I could probably just spend the whole rest of our time going over different studies done about mindset values interventions. Um, it's one of the most well studied and has um, kind of aspects of a mindset change and has been shown to be one of the most powerful and effective interventions. Um, but why? Well, we think it's because it gives deeper meaning to everyday tasks. The small stressors of daily life become viewed through the lens of greater values and are brushed off more easily. Um, and this comes back to, again, how we talk to ourselves about stress and then how we talk to others about it. Um, so there might be a morning, I look ahead at my day, like, okay, I've got a lot of clients to see. I have emails to respond to. I need to take care of my kids and they have soccer practice and my husband needs this. And so I could just go, oh, it's just gonna be a really stressful day. So much stress going on. But if I pause myself instead and go, wow, I get to see clients, which is a job I love to do and have always wanted to do. Um, I'm gonna have to respond to emails, but that's like just keeping up contact with people. And I love to make sure that um, I'm still in communication with others. Um, with my kids, like I, at one point in my life, didn't know if I would be able to have children. And so isn't it an amazing gift that I have these children to take care of and so on and so forth. And it doesn't have to be, you know, that sounds like I have this life where I can like take 30 minutes to talk to myself about what my day is going to be. But instead of I can kind of just switch that thinking, thinking about it now, right, I can kind of name those values. But if instead of I going, oh, it's going to be so stressful, if I can go, wow, I have a really full day ahead, like I have a, a full day of meeting um, my larger purpose. Um, it's meeting my values. That will really change how you carry out these tasks. And it'll change, um, as you'll see as we go on here, your, your biochemistry um, of how you play out that stress in your life. Um, and so um, 
we're going to kind of protect our time tonight because uh, I don't want to keep you guys on here for hours and hours. Um, I think, believe, Lisa, they have this on the handout then, right? The context? Yes. Sheet. Okay, okay. Right. just sent through the chat. Okay. Um, and so these are just two exercises. Um, you can see one and two here that you can do um, on your own time. And what I want you to do is just to think through these for yourself. Um, if you take like 10 or even 15 minutes another time um, to go through these, what gives meaning in my life? Um, think through these different aspects of what gives meaning. Um, and think through that. If you didn't have stress, what would you miss out on? Um, and then for some of you, it might be, are there things you're currently missing out on because you've kind of desired to avoid stress? Um, are there things I, I don't want to do because I'm worried it would be stressful? And could it possibly be meaning that you're missing out on meaningful experiences? Um, so um, take time to go through that for yourself. And the next piece, and this is a really, um, really effective intervention to do um, for yourself and for others, um, is to choose top three values and then pick one to write about. And just take 10 minutes, 15 minutes writing about why is this value really important to me? Um, why is this what I use to kind of motivate what I'm doing in my everyday? Um, these can be really important pieces to look at and to kind of undergird you going forward. And again, allowing you to move from my life is so stressful to my life is really meaningful. Um, you know, you won't be surprised after everything I said to say that they've seen that as they study people, the people that say they have the most meaningful lives are also the people that say they have the most stressful lives. There's just, there's obvious correlation there. And so again, if, can we think my life is stressful or my life is meaningful? Lisa, I'll pause there. Are there just a check in if there's questions? I know I've been going through a lot of material here. Sure. Yeah. So if you have questions, feel free to send them in the chat to me and we'll post them to Christine. So you can see that the handout should have come through in the chat. Uh, a minute ago, you can open the PDF version of the handout. And one thing I failed to mention is if you do this exercise, it can be really good, to, you know, because I mentioned one of the aspects of changing your mindset is to share it with others. Mm -hmm. And so even doing this with a friend, um, spouse, um, sibling, whatever, um, but walking through this together and then sharing with each other what you wrote um, can be very effective in this as well. I'm giving everybody a minute here just in case there's questions coming through, but I don't see any as of yet. Okay. Oh, just kidding. <laughs> uh, somebody asked, I've heard it described before that there is good stress and bad stress. Is there bad stress that should be avoided and is never considered meaningful or helpful? That's an excellent question. Great question. Um, I, what I have seen written about that, and Dr. McGonigal references that in the book, um, is that that research has been widely disregarded, um, that there hasn't been any true sense of like how you can label bad stress versus good stress. Um, I think as I talk to you, to this group tonight, what I can be concerned about is going, well, Christy says, as long as it has meaning, it's fine to do. <laughs> um, there's a whole nother conversation to have about boundaries and balance in your life. Um, so do know that. So don't take everything I've said tonight and go like, great, um, go all out and everything. But no, I, um, as far as I've understood it from what I have done, because I'd wondered about that true, I think they called it use stress and distress from what I remember. Um, the use stress, I think was the positive. Um, as far as I understand, um, that has been, Dr. McGonagall felt, had kind of looked back through that and there's been a lot of debate on it. But in our case, no, there's, there's not bad stress. I would say that probably means it's something that's not giving meaning in your life. I'd almost want to reframe that as we go through these things tonight. Like, okay, that's just actually not something that's a part of my purpose or things like that. Does that make sense? Yeah, I think so. Okay. Um, somebody also asked if you could repeat the last um, connection about meaning, a meaningful life and stress. You, you made a conclusive statement about uh, how meaningful, living a meaningful life and stress are connected. Could you repeat that part? Um, I think my conclusion is that 
a meaningful life is also a stressful life. Um, and so as they've studied people, um, I just have done some large overall research on people who would call their lives very meaningful. Um, they also have the higher levels of stress. And so stress, the, the thing I want you to be hearing in that is stress is not something to be avoided. Um, by avoiding stress, we would be then avoiding things that are meaningful in our lives. Great. And then somebody, uh, maybe last question, somebody asked if you're familiar with um, the book Grit and the work of Angela Duckworth, and do you find this similar at all, if you are familiar? You know, I, I know of it. I haven't read it myself, so I wouldn't want to comment on it. Um, I think, is that a, I think does she go into resilience? And so a lot of that is also connected to mindset, I believe. So mm -hmm. it might be similar, you might see some similarities in that. All right, thanks for that. Okay, so the next area we're gonna look at is moving from threat to challenge. Um, as I mentioned, I played basketball. And when my coaches wanted me to play well, um, it was an unfortunate reality that I have to get angry to play basketball well. Um, and so they would just go after me and try to get me mad. And, you know, and if you're like playing sports in general and you see the professional athletes, they're always like yelling at each other and trying to get each other going, right? Um, but what do you do when you go to take a test? and you're feeling upset, calm down, just take deep breaths, just let it out. But if you think about it, both an athlete and a student want to perform well. They both need high performances. So why is it that we tell athletes to amp themselves up and we tell students to calm themselves down? Um, this question led to an understanding of two types of responses to stress. Um, the first is the threat response, um, kind of your classic fight or flight. Um, and in this, your heart rate increases, adrenaline kicks in, a fear response happens, you're scared. Um, and the body can respond with miraculous um, strength even, right? It's the, um, there's a huge threat in Belson, so I can lift this car like Superman because I can save people now. Um, with a threat response though, that's what's tied to a more negative cardio response long-term. And so when you've heard about like, well, stress can cause heart attacks, things like that, it's often because this threat response is what's happening chronically. Um, the challenge response on the other hand is similar in that the heart rate increases and adrenaline is released. Um, and there's also a strong chemical response. But what's different is, is that it's focused, not fearful. So that fear piece is taken out um, and the hormones are slightly different in that response. Okay. There's a higher level of that DHEA, which allows for learning, for that growth from the experience um, and so forth. But when you think about like that professional athlete or that artist, this brain surgeon, when they're doing what they are skilled in and they're doing it well, they are in this challenge state. They're not calm. So they've just not, they've not figured out some kind of like meditative um, place to be in. So they're not calm. Instead, they're in a very healthy challenged response state. Um, so let's um, play this out a little further. A study that helps demonstrate this um, was research done by Dr. Jeremy Jamison. Um, you may or may not have, I hadn't heard of this before. The social stress test um, is used to test effects of understanding um, excuse me, social stress test is used to test effects of understanding benefits of the stress response. Feels like I'm reading Dr. Seuss there. Um, what the social stress test does is it puts participants through a public speaking component and a math solving component. And I was just rereading about this today. Um, it's actually quite awful. Um, it was uh, created in Germany in the 90s. And um, what they do is they put people um, participants come in, they're told you're going to need to do a public speaking for us. You're going to do a speech. No, you may not have notes. Um, and then they're presented to give this speech. I think it's about three to five minutes long. And the experts are watching them, supposedly experts on the topic, but actually they're experts in making you as uncomfortable as possible. They've been trained to avoid eye contact, to sigh, to look at their watch, to tap. Um, and at the end, they're often told to go, <sighs> just stop. 
Um, and so public speaking is a normal stressor for most people, but in that environment, it really does a good job of ratcheting up the stress. And then these people are asked to do a math component. And um, it's mentioned that when people are asked to do math, it actually triggers the same spot in the brain that triggers physical pain. Um, so for those of you that don't love math, you're like, yes, that makes sense. Um, but these people are asked to do math on the spot because it's supposed to test how good they are at thinking on their feet. But if they're doing well at the math, it only gets harder. So they're making sure they fail. So that's what you're put through in this. Um, so what they did though, is they just decided to do an intervention. Before you do this, um, this test, we're gonna do one group, you know, it's our control group, one group, just ignore your stress, just ignore that. That's not helpful, just ignore it. Um, and another group though has shown how benefits of the stress response um, can be good for your body and how our bodies are actually trying to rise to the occasion. Um, as you can imagine, the first group and the second group, the control group and the ignore your stress had no changes in their performance. For the group that had the mindset intervention, there was incredible results. They had an in increased perception of their internal resources. So they had a better sense of, I can do this. Okay, my body's trying to help me with this. Um, their cardiovascular response moved from that threat to the challenge. They were able to measure that. They presented with more confidence and better body language as they did their speeches. Overall, they just performed better. Um, and afterwards, they found that they even had more resilience to the fear of failure. Um, so that's what's really incredible about this, is if you can learn to embrace how your body responds to stress and kind of use that as a tool and as a resource, you will actually then be teaching yourself for the longer term how to be in that challenge place rather than the threat place. Because the, the difficulty of the threat response is that it also teaches you to avoid the threat the next time. So if you've had that threat response, I'm scared of this, don't do it, avoid it. You're actually gonna be teaching your brain for the next time, avoid it, avoid it, avoid it. If you're in that challenge place, instead they find that you're much more up for the next challenge and you go, I can do this. And you're actually becoming inoculated um, from that negative stress response. So that's why this is so important. It's not that, okay, maybe you can do a three minute speech better next time. It's because long-term it's preventing those negative biological effects on you. Um, so how do you do this? How do you embrace your somatic reactions to stress, your bodily reactions to stress? First, you need to reframe what your body is doing. Um, for example, um, if your heart starts to race as you get nervous, your heart is racing because you're excited about the opportunity coming. Your stomach is feeling nervous um, as it is releasing chemicals to increase the performance. Um, it's not that you're gonna be sick. Um, your palms are sweaty because you're close to something you desire. Um, especially when I was younger, I my hands shook like crazy when I would do speeches. And so now if that happens to me, I think, yeah, it's just because you're so excited about this information you have to share. You can't wait for it. And, and you're gonna tell me, Christy, but that's like lying to myself. And at first it's gonna feel that way. Trust me though, if you start to teach yourself to embrace your body and recognize that your body's trying to help you, um, your thinking will even start to change and you'll be able to use your body as a resource. It's going to feel unnatural at first, I get that. Um, but give it a try. The other piece is catch those negative cognitions. So again, that self-talk voice, I want you kind of raising the volume on. I'm too nervous to talk becomes, I'm so excited to share this information or, oh, I could totally mess up becomes, I could do this really well and really um, just be so excited again about what I get to um, share or how I get to perform today. Um, we can change those cognitions. We can change the way we think towards our body. Um, and again, just because I, I, I wanna keep encouraging this thought, um, I think we're seeing in this that this is God's redemptive hand on us. He goes, yeah, this is stressful and this can seem hard, but is it meaningful for you? And also your body will help you. I've given you a body to help you in this. Um, and so that's what we wanna look at next for you. And Lisa, I think we thought we might have them break out for this one. Is that, does that work well or should we? Yes. Yeah. Okay. okay. So why don't we just take a few minutes so we can mix it up a little bit here. Um, talk with your group about these questions. Um, and again, when you come back, if there's questions, I can answer those, but then we'll keep moving on too.
So for your breakout rooms, you can access, obviously, it'll be in a different room. You can uh, either view this slide or view it on your uh, handout that I sent through the chat just a moment ago. I'm going to create the rooms and you can uh, spend, Christy, what, what do we think, five, five to seven minutes or so? Yeah, probably more towards five, just because I know I'm using yeah. that hard time here. We'll, we'll say five minutes discussing in your groups. So I'm... Uh, our next uh, oops, uh, piece we want to look at, our mindset rechange, is connect. Um, as um, you probably know, initially responses to stress were thought to fall entirely into two categories. You've heard of fight or flight, um, and actually they talk about freeze a lot as well. But um, so you either are going to fight someone or you're going to avoid them, and those are how we respond. Um, but whatever, but however, what they have found is that connection is a third option. Um, and this actually proves really helpful. Um, so what do we mean by that? Um, they call this the tend and befriend. And so if you tend to someone and you're befriending someone, um, in doing that, you've decided to help someone else, you're actually activating a state in your brain that triggers courage and creates hope. Um, and so they actually see your kind of how your brain's responding changes as you reach out to someone in your distress. Um, one thing they talked about a lot, for example, is like if you had like a family member that had a serious illness, and let's say that was just really disturbing to you, so you wanted to kind of avoid them, they actually find that that increases your negative stress response. But instead, if you reach out to each other, um, that um, again mitigates those negative side effects. Um, and like one study I can think of is um, people, participants could watch their loved one experience like these shocks and they were able to feel the shock first. And um, if they agreed to the study, their loved one would still experience the shocks, but they could either choose to hold their hand or squeeze a stress ball. So holding a hand, maybe helping the other, you know, reaching out, tending and befriending or attending to their own distress. Um, and they found the people that reached out mitigated the pain and mitigated the stress for themselves. So we see that it's really powerful when you reach out to someone um, and connect with others. Um, another study uh, found that there's a strong contrast between those that were active in the community and those that are not. For those that were not active in their community, a new stressor was highly correlated with likelihood of sickness. So if you're not real connected in your community, not reaching out to others, um, uh, you have a major stressor hit, um, highly likely you could get sick from that or have other negative health consequences. However, for those that were active and connected in their community, I really didn't believe this and I've like even checked my notes a few times, there was zero correlation between stress and negative health developments. Um, and so again, the very significant data there um, and um, the importance of us being connected with others. Um, another piece of generosity with your time and money is shown also to increase positive results in the brain. Um, one study out of Wharton concluded that if you feel like you have no time, the best way to gain time is use some of it to help others. Now, again, given the community I'm talking to right now, I'm a little concerned saying that. So um, again, we need to keep this in the context of all the other pieces we're talking about. And if someone's telling you in your life that you're not boundaried enough, you do not get to use me against them. Um, but um, it is interesting to know that the more um, we share of our resources, um, the healthier we are. Again, does that sound familiar? It seems a little bit like something we read in the Bible. Um, it's also important to look for connections outside of ourselves. Um, finding goals that are greater than ourselves decreases our stress and increases our performance. Um, so this could be um, in your workplace, in your ministry, in your family, um, but if you find these goals um, that kind of reach far beyond who you are and just your world, um, you're going to find that that protects you from negative health um, stress. And to be honest, as I've read some of that, I've actually wondered if for Christian cross-cultural workers, that is why at times we've had some built-in protection. Um, because a lot of us are hopefully here because we have these broader life goals that are outside of ourselves. And so just kind of a cool thing to be noticing is that God really cares about each of you <laughs> and each of us and has even given us that protection in, by, as we live out what he wants for us, that actually increases health for us too. It's not that he's forgotten about us in the midst of his work. 
Um, and finally, even a sense of common humanity um, can help you decrease, again, those negative effects of stress and help with your suffering overall. Um, people that can recognize how others they know or don't know have similar struggles present with significant higher resilience and coping skills. And so this can be as simple as you're in bed one night and you're worried about a problem. But if you lay there and think, you know, there's other people out there that also have this problem. I'm not alone in this. Even just that and not even knowing a specific person can increase your coping skills and give you higher resilience. Um, and so this reaching out, this connection with others is incredibly important um, for those of us, um, myself included, that can tend to kind of rely on myself. I'm pretty independent. I use my own resources. This is such helpful information and helpful reminder to go, but hey, it's really important for my health and for others to reach out to them though and allow them to walk with me when I'm hurting or when I'm experiencing stress. And for all of us, that's going to create a healthier outcome. Um, and so we're just gonna, uh, we'll stay in the big group again, just um, for time's sake. Um, but this is something for you to, again, do later um, and to share with someone else is think about your goals. Are there goals that are bigger than you? You know, and for all of us, sometimes we can go, oh yeah, there are. And then we realize like, well, actually I just want everyone to think I'm really good at my job. And so this can be a good moment to kind of challenge yourself and remember it's not just about my performance in this moment. It's about this broader, bigger than myself goal I have. Um, and to think about how can you connect with others when you are stressed? Are you reaching out? For those that are like me that go, oh, I can probably just handle it. I don't need to talk to anyone about it. Recognize that it's not even about that anymore. <laughs> it's about, this is going to actually just increase your health overall. Um, and it's going to be better for others too, that you're doing that. And again, in what ways do you, can you give of yourself and resources during stressful times? Um, and again, notice it's also, do you, <laughs> in other words, for those of you that are like, I do do a lot already. This is not an opportunity to decide I need to add more if that's a, a struggle you're having right now. Okay, but um, overall noticing that connection is so important. Um, okay, um, why don't I pause just for a minute though, Lisa, in case there's questions and then we'll do our final mindset change. Sure, yeah, any questions for Christy right now? A question about um, if there's a, any any kind of correlation or help between connecting with uh, specific people. Like, are there is it is it better to connect with with your kind of close circle or just helping somebody that's kind of outside of your circle, like a stranger or somebody maybe you're doing ministry to? Does mm -hmm. that make any difference in this connection? It doesn't. Um, not when we're talking about that kind of tending and befriending and helping. Mm -hmm. um, interestingly, what they found is that even like. Um, whether it be of giving of your time or your money, if someone is almost forced to do it, that can still be good for them. And so, um, in other words, it doesn't always matter who or what, yeah, like who you're giving that to or what you're doing, but it actually can still um, allow for good results in your health. Mm -hmm. um, so, no, there isn't, there wasn't like um, a direct correlation in any of the studies I found between who you're doing that for versus who you're not. Um, yeah, another question kind of correlated. Um, someone says, when you're in a stressful situation, some people might say you're in a time of receiving or needing to receive help from others. How do you draw the line when you feel you might not have the capacity to give if stressed? Maybe how do you know when to, when to set the boundaries versus when to, yeah. to give and connect? Yeah, and as you can imagine, I'm actually talking to people a lot about that right now as they come out of Ukraine and Russia. Um, because there's a lot of opportunities to continue helping right now. Um, and so that's a little like 
I'll just give what I would say about that. It's not necessarily connected to this research. Um, I think that becomes about where you're at in this moment right now. And so also listening very much to the advice from people around you. Um, but I don't tell all of my workers, like, just stop helping anyone right now, because I don't think that would be good for them. Now, some of them are gonna be at different places of how much they can give and how much they can do. And what I wanna encourage and empower people to do is to instead kind of um, use like a good self check-in. If I'm, um, I, I even just use like a really quick and simple, a zero to 10, 10 is the best I've ever felt, zero is the worst I felt. And this morning I'm at a seven or eight, I think I'm okay to like help someone today. And then I'm gonna check in with myself again later and see where's that number at. I'm kind of talking about people obviously that are in like pretty intense crisis situations here. But, um, but if you're at like three or four on that, that probably means I do need rest and I need to kind of approach this in a different way. But I think it is interesting that research shows that it is good for us to be helping. And so I don't think we wanna say only be on the receiving end right now. At the same time, if someone in your life that you really trust is saying, that's really where you need to be, that's an important voice to listen to because they might kind of know where you're at in that check-in level then too. Yeah, great. And somebody else asked, if someone gives themselves unrealistic goals, how might that impact their stress? Okay, that's the question. Um, I'll try uh, to start the way I'm hearing it. So. Uh, Sorry, Lisa. Oh, yeah, I'll just maybe restate it. If yeah. does it impact somebody's stress if their goals are unrealistic, unobtainable? I would think so because then you're really out of control of that goal being met. And I think I would probably gently challenge that person then about what is the value connected to that. What is the um, kind of that purpose piece again? Um, Attainable goals um, are, are usually better because they are attainable. Um, and also because they're more aware of what the capabilities are then, whether it be the person or the situation. Um, and so sometimes, I'm not saying always, but sometimes, I'm sorry if you're hearing those sirens, um, if we have those really highly unattainable goals, it might, and I'm not saying always, but it might sometimes be because we've decided I need to like kind of prove myself in this way or something. And so it's being disconnected from our meaning and from that, um, that purpose that we're trying to achieve. Does that make sense? Well, Lisa, you can tell me if that makes sense. Yeah, I think so. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Okay. yeah. All the questions that have come in. So let's okay. go. Great. Ahead. This last section, I always come in, I enter into it very, very carefully and very gently um, because this out of context can be taken very, very badly and has been taken very, very badly or done very badly historically by the church at times, by others. And so we wanna be really careful with how we talk about this now. Um, I've mentioned to you, I've walked through complicated pregnancy. I've seen um, difficulties um, for my kids. Um, we've gone through some things in our own life. Um, I sit with people that are going through just um, horrific evil experiences. Um, and so I don't come to you as someone that is naive about what adversity in this life can look like um, and what evil in this world can do. Um, I'm, I'm well aware of that. And that awareness makes me wanna actually to be very careful in how we talk about this. At the same time, we don't wanna be so scared of talking about adversity in this way that we don't notice that God has provided even routes of redemption in our suffering. Um, and so um, I've called this part um, claiming gospel truth. Um, Dr. McGonigal is not yet a believer, and so she probably would not use that language, but I felt like it just so directly correlates with what the Bible shares with us. I, I, re I changed that one um, for myself. Um, what's really fascinating, though, is um, the psychological, psychological community has really wanted to reject some of this research. They just find it unacceptable um, to talk about this. And so that was really interesting for me to read. I think without hope, um, this can be especially difficult to see. Um, but there was a study done um, by Dr. Siri called Whatever Does Not Kill Us. Um, and in this study, it showed that there were 
um, strengths in people that had gone through a moderate level of adversity. Um, and so there's kind of like a U curve. And if you'd gone through this so much of adversity, um, you were actually healthier, more resilient than people that had experienced no adversity. Now, I should say though, for the other side of the U curve of people that have gone through extreme amounts of adversity, um, Dr. Siri would say there's simply not enough research to comment on those people. So in any given study you do, you just don't have enough people on that end to get enough of a data sample. Um, and so the reason I'm, I'm emphasizing that is because some people hear this and go, oh, well, I've just had an extreme amount of adversity or I'm walking with someone that's at this extreme end. That does not mean that we don't see these benefits for them, just the research isn't there. And Dr. Siri said anecdotally, he'd say those people are often doing quite well um, because um, of their experiences. Um, and people who had experienced moderate levels of adversity, so again, just going back to the study, were healthier than those who had experienced low or only or very minimum amounts of adversity. They had lower risk of depression, better physical health, and greater life satisfaction. Um, why does the psychological community struggle with this? Because what they hear is you're endorsing trauma or suffering. And I think we need to make that really clear is no matter what you've been through, we're never gonna say that experience itself was good. Um, if evil is perpetrated on someone, that is always bad, that is always evil. The way I see it is God and his goodness has allowed that to become redemptive in someone's life. And so that can allow for um, growth and better health in those people. Um, and so it's really actually very encouraging research, but I think probably most of you understand why I'm wanting to be so careful in how we say this. Um, so again, the event is always horrible, it's always bad. Um, but perhaps is there some redemption that can happen for the, the victim of that, for what they've been through? Um, and so, for example, one thing that is encouraged is, um, is benefit finding. Um, and what I mean by that is when participants in studies have been asked to find an upside to their difficulty, they have experienced increased positive biological responses. So again, it's changing their body, changing that chemistry. And they were moved from the threat response to the challenge response. And so like, for example, a lot of studies were done on caregivers. Um, and as they would try to write like each day, like just one positive thing about their work that day, overall, they just saw decreased burnout rates and better health for those caregivers and able to see more positives in their life. Again, does that mean that as you cared for someone that was dying, that became a good experience or that that death was good? No. It's saying we're trying to protect you from the, the, the negative effects of the stress this can have on you by seeing that there are maybe a skill you have gained or experience um, things you've learned about yourself through this that can be positive. We wanna be really careful about encouraging that in others. Um, like, you know, that, that's not, this, so this doesn't mean someone comes to you with grief or you're in grief right now and you go, well, I better find the positive in this right now. You know, that's not, we want, this needs to be a genuine thing. and. Um, they actually find that if you ignore all of the negatives of the situation and you try to just be in the positive, that is equally detrimental to your health. So this is trying to help us find that tension between going, there's great suffering, could there also be benefits? Doing that together, holding that tension, that is what brings health. Um, and so, um, but I just find that really amazing and, and to study in my field and to see people have such difficulty with that and to go, but wow, like, but this is actually what the Bible has been saying in, in so many ways. And again, I know that can be misapplied and applied badly, but I think we also need to go forward carefully, but with hope that there can be good for these people that have been through these experiences and for ourselves as we've been through these experiences. Um, another piece that was interesting was post-traumatic growth can also happen. Um, and um, that means like when people even share their stories about these good things that have happened out, out of their really awful experience, that can even be vicarious and help others experience resilience and protect them from um, future stress. Um, and so again, that, and that kind of brings together all that connection and um, that um, understanding of how we've been created and wired to do these things, it kind of brings it all together there. Um, but that's you know one I would, want, I would also encourage you to look at for yourself then is adversity, how has it affected you? Um, has that 
Um, what experiences have come up for you? How has it changed you? Sure, there's, there's probably some negative ways. There's some things that have really hurt and brought great pain. Is there any place where we can go? But I've also seen this piece come forward and I've learned this about myself. I've learned this about others in a positive way. That's, you know, claiming that Romans 8, 28, I didn't mention that, but, and we know that in all things, God works for the good of those who love him, who've been called according to his purpose. Again, you know, I have to really challenge myself because I can look at that scripture and go, oh, but I've heard so many people use that so badly for others. And so then we kind of can be scared to even say it to ourselves, but, but let's reclaim that in like a health, in a healthy way and recognizing that it is for our health and for our good. Um, and that God has, a, again, another redemptive path and even how he's wired us. Um, so I would encourage that for you to take that time again. And if you can share that with someone else after you do the exercise, that can be really um, powerful for you. So just to kind of end our time together then, um, stress, uh, could there be an upside? Can it bring stagnation in your life or could it bring growth? And so thinking through that context, what kind of meaning is it bringing in your life? What are the values in it? That challenge, could it be challenge rather than a threat? Can we connect with others um, in midst of that stress? And can we claim the gospel truth um, in midst of these difficult times? Uh, my email is there. You are welcome uh, to reach out to me with questions. We'll give some time for questions here as well. Um, but these are things I love to be thinking about, as you've probably figured out. I love studying psychology. I love talking about it. Um, and so I'm happy to um, connect further with you as well. But Lisa, if there's any questions, we can do those now. Yeah, yeah. If you have questions, please send them to me. As you're doing that, I'll just mention uh, Christy. I mean, I've taken at least a page of notes here as Christy's been talking. I don't know about the rest of you, but uh, she's also agreed just to provide her notes. There's a lot of good information and data studies and sources that you might um, might be interested in. So Christy is uh, going to include those and we'll put those on the website along with the recording here um, and the handout that, that I send to all of you when, when the recording goes up probably tomorrow. So just so you're aware, you can you can find that uh, on, the, on our website. Check in tomorrow or the next day for that. Uh, okay, question coming in. Could Christy address how to view stress, uh, which you choose? So work, ministry, family-related stress, which you choose maybe to engage in, and stress, which is not really by choice, like injury or illness that wasn't chosen, war, uh, and how to change your mindset on those really negative circumstances. So maybe the implication that it's easier to change your mindset on the on the stressors that you choose to engage with. Mm -hmm. How about the ones that are really, really hard and awful and you didn't choose? Mm -hmm. I think that last section about claim is where that comes into play. Um, again, it's, you know, even for that person asking me, I want to be so careful, but um, they do encourage that if you take like that illness and go, but what have I learned about myself in this? What have I seen in this situation? What have I, if you're a Christ follower, what have I learned about God in this situation? Um, things like that. Um, that is what can then be protective to you about that stress, because you're exactly right. There's just stressors we don't choose to have. Um, I think then though, so you can do that kind of work, but you could also kind of go then, um, how would I say it? So for example, um, I know people that have um, struggled with like chronic pain, chronic illness. And when they, first of all, when they, they even talk about those people in the book a lot, and um, I've worked with people like that and um, as they can kind of claim or see like, here's a benefit in this, here's something I've learned about myself, um, that's strong. But then I think also then using your values to then kind of reorient orient you in that. So it's like kind of these other pieces come into play as well that you can kind of go back to the drawing board, so to speak, and go, okay, so what are my values? How can those be played out in this? How do I understand that value in light of the situation? And I think that can also be protective then as you work through that. Yeah, thanks. Any other questions? We're wrapping up. You have maybe another minute or so to send in a question.
question about resources. It sounds like this, the book that you're, uh, the Kelly McGonigal book that you're, you've listed is, is maybe a top resource. Is there any other kind of reading or resources that you'd really recommend to people for, for follow up on this topic? Um, the book is probably really helpful because it has even more exercises than I've offered. Mm -hmm. um, so it's probably like the easiest place to begin, I would say. So mine is well thumbed through, traveled, <laughs> um, but that's probably the best place to begin, I would say. Okay, excellent. All right, lots of people um, saying thank you for this. It's been really insightful and helpful. I absolutely agree personally, and I'm already thinking about one or two things uh, we'll do as a, as a part of our maybe staff meetings um, differently in, in order to, to incorporate some of this. So found it really helpful. So thanks very much, Christy, for your time and uh, sharing. I just, um, I will send, um, or rather we'll, we will, we will add this, as I said, to the website in the next day or so. And the handout and Christy's notes will be included in that. So if for some reason you didn't get those, then please just check back on our website under the webinar section um, tomorrow and you should have access to all of those. Good day to everyone. Thanks again for joining us and um, we'll see you next time.